there. Welcome back to Board Game Specialists. I'm your host, Carla, today, and I am riding solo. Melanie is in the middle of a big move. She's moving from one town to another, so she's been pretty busy this last little while. But you'll get to hear from her next. So to start it off, I was going to talk about the games I've been playing. One of the first games that I've been playing a few times is called Fabled Fruit. Um, a friend of mine, Ashley, she purchased this used after we played it at Malcon, And we've been chipping away at it. I think we're maybe a quarter way through because it's kind of a little campaign game. You can save your game at the end and then continue on from it the next time you play. It's, it's a really neat game. It's just a card game where you lay out these different sets of cards that are all little worker placement spots. And you go to them to collect fruits, which are cards. Um, and then once you have enough fruits, you will be able to buy one of the cards. So then you put it in front of you. And once you have four cards in front of you, you have won the game. And that is it, it is so simple. But it's it, to me, it's like a little chess match. Because you're trying to, you know, obviously do it before the other person or other people. We've only played it at two players so far. But it's neat because you can, there's different things that will come into the game. Because as soon as you finish off one pile, because there's four cards in each of these piles, then a whole new pile comes out with a different um, mechanism. So you a new place to go to. So the game is constantly changing. It's really neat. Another one we played was a game called Summit. Now, this is an older game um, made a few years ago but and didn't get a whole lot of buzz that I know of. But Mr. Trey Parker from South Park, he was on the Dice Tower and listed as his number one game. Well, immediately that game sold out everywhere possible. You cannot find that game anywhere. She happened to win it at Malcon. Someone had donated it which is really nice. And then we played it a three-player game of it, a competitive version. You can also play um, cooperative, which is really cool. And what you're trying to do is climb a mountain. So you want to get to the top and then get back down. And you have to um, go up all these different types of ropes because you're mountain climbing. Now you can um, block other people by making their route harder if they're behind you. Or there's different cards, uh, karma, and different items that can help you or hinder other people. You can make it as mean as you want this game. Or you could just kind of go off on your own and just try to do the best you can. But I think it is intended to be a meaner game because, which I don't know. I'm not a mountain climber, but I don't know if people mountain climb and they will literally try to slow other people down. <laughs> not sure if that's how it works. It doesn't work that way in hiking, I know. I'm a hiker, but it's a really interesting game. And I think she backed some of the new expansions because they have since then. It might still be even on Kickstarter, if not just finished, but have reprinted the game that you can back as well as a bunch of expansions that were already um, out there and actually are releasing a new one. I can't remember the names of them, but. It's a really cool game, actually. I'm glad she kept that one. Another game we played actually just last night was called The Magnificent. Now, this is a dice placement game. I had passed up on this game years ago just from listening to one bad review. So there it goes to show. Don't take advice from one review, one reviewer. Go, you know, if there's a game that interests you, check out a few different ones. Because this one is awesome. Like it's the theme is your um, magicians and you are putting on different performances and you're collecting workers and assistants and all, all kinds of things that will help you perform better. That is the theme behind it. The theme is very loose in the game. It's a very mechanical game and you could probably have put any theme in this game, but it works for what it is. So what you're doing is you are, you have three different actions you can take. You can build, you can perform, or you can travel. And now you have four master cards in front of you. So you have four turns in the base game where you will get to 
um, drafted dice. There's a pile of dice on the board. You get to draft one and you'll place it down. And depending what color it is, if you are building, you will get to take these polyominal tiles and then you will place them on your board and they will cover up different bonuses. So that's one aspect of putting them on your board. You also could possibly have a scoring card, a scoring master card that will want you to have light colors, like completely all together and make the biggest square rectangle possible. You could also need them for just the shapes that they are is what the performances require. So you might have three different shapes that you need for one performance and then one of those shapes and some different ones for another performance. But if you perform them at the same time, you have to have separate um, polyominal shapes for each performance. So that's what building is. If you were going to travel, there are these little rondelles, three rondelles on the board that are in three different colors. And depending which dice you take, you will get to travel. And so you will move this wagon, however many spaces that you have pips on your dice that you have drafted. And you'll get to pick up crystals, which help you um, up your pips on the dice. Um, You could also grab tents, which you need to have in front of a performance poster in order to actually perform. It's a good way to collect those things in order to be able to perform. Now, if you do a performance, you're going to, at the top of your board, you'll have all these tents and posters that you've collected, and you'll have to have a poster in front of a tent in order to perform that. Now, depending on the pips of the dice, we'll decide how many performances you can do, because if you have a certain amount, you'll be able to place your little hat on a bo- on the board, and you will get to perform up from one performance up to five, which is the max. It's very tricky to get five performances because you need a lot of pips added together. And the way you would get a lot is once I've grabbed an orange die, the next time if I grabbed another orange die, it would be added to those pips. So if I had a six the first time and a six the second, that would be 12. So for building, traveling, or performing, the higher, the better, because you can get more things, move more um, spaces or move up to a higher performance level. It's a really awesome game. I really enjoyed this. Those were the three that I'm talking about that I've played. Now I did want to mention a few games because I am talking about solo games. I'm not even sure if I said that at the beginning, but I'm talking about my favorite solo games. Now I have a huge variety of solo games that I play. So I am limiting this list to me, uh, light to minimal setup. I'm not talking about my big heavy Euro games or anything like that this time. I'm going to talk about the easy, I won't say easy, I'll just say lighter, but easy setup, definitely. So before I get into those, I wanted to talk about three new ones that are coming that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. Two of them especially because they have been released that, well, one was a Kickstarter. I did not back it, but I was going to wait for retail. Another one is a a remake. And the third one is just one that I have just found out about in the last few months. So the first one is called Bandata. Now this is a bird um, themed game, but it's a dice placement game. And it's a solo game. It's made for solo. Very, I think it's very light. I haven't gotten too deep depth into the rules and everything, but looks like it's right up my alley. Just a nice dice placement where you're trying to choose different birds for different, um, I think they want to like someone to be together or not. I don't know hundred percent, but that is um, the first one that was made by Chase Estep. Now, the next one is SOS Titanic. This one is an older game, but you could never find this. It was impossible to find or it was extremely expensive if it was on the used market. This one's by Bruna Cathala and Ludovic Mal- Malblack. It is a card game and it basically follows the um, solitaire... Um, now I can't think of the name of it. There's a type of solitaire that it does. 
the name is escaping me, but it's where you have, you know, you have to have a red and a black, red, black, and then like you would go down in the number. Klondike, that's what it is, Klondike Solitaire. So that's the mechanic of it, but it's people, obviously, you're you're um, stacking people and I think different like class categories. I'm thinking that's what it is. That was a long time ago that I looked at the the rules of it, but it looks really neat and it is on a lot of solo lists if you've ever looked into that. So I'm looking forward to that one coming out. And the third one is a, a newer, it's not even out yet. It's not even out on Kickstarter, but it's kind of been um, hyped a little bit in the last few months. And that's called Trailblazers by Ryan Courtney. Now there is another Trailblazers game that was on Kickstarter a few months ago. And that's a big like hiking um, worker placement movement game. This one is if you've ever played any of Ryan Courtney's games, Pipeline or um, Curious Cargo, he has um, little tiles that are pipes that all connect together. So this one is the same type of thing, only it's trails. So I don't know a whole lot about this one either, but I've already heard it on <laughs> someone's solo list. Not sure how they got to play. They might have got a prototype and got to play it, but they said it's just awesome. And it looks like you can carry it in this little bag, so it would be very nice for travel. And who doesn't love, like, a, you know, making paths and, like, just connecting different tiles of different routes and whatnot. And the theme is, I believe, is camping or trail. When you're trailblazing, obviously, you're hiking. It just sounds really neat to me. So those are three that I'm really looking forward to coming. So now we'll get into my top nine. But of course, I have a few honorable mentions. The first one I want to talk about is called Mr. Cabbage Head's Garden. This is by Todd Sanders. And it is a game that I kickstarted. This was also one that was made a while ago and then was very hard to find. I don't think they, they did a huge print run of the first one. And then they reprinted it and kickstarted again. And I did back at that time. This is a garden game. So you are just playing cards out into a grid of eventually you'll have a six by three grid. Now you can play this with two players, but it I think it was purposely made for solo and then they maybe added the two player, which is good as well. But it is a really neat solo game because you are placing different vegetables in a grid and it's a type of a Sudoku-like puzzle because you want certain ones, some places, connected to each other and then other ones you want, you know, connected to each other as well. But you want some in certain columns depending on the scoring because there's five different types of scoring, I believe which I think would be neat if they came out with some more scoring. Um, end game scoring would be neat. But the one thing is you're not just building that, is that you're also drafting cards, and you have three cards in front of you, and one of them is free, and one of them you would get a B, which is sort of like a, an income, and the other one you'd have to pay a B. And the Bs are valuable because if one round three cards come up and you really need that one card, but you have no bees left to pay, then you're out of luck. The other thing that makes it a little trickier is you will always on every turn pull out from a bag, a chip that is a neighbor and you'll have three to four neighbors in each game and they all are wanting to steal your vegetables or do something negative to you. So you'll pull out one of these chips and put it, on the correct neighbor and then after five rounds I believe you will look and see who has the most and then whatever their ability is you will have to apply that so they could very well steal one of your vegetables or move it around or there's all different types of, of things they could do and it, the game comes with a whole bunch of different neighbors so it's kind of neat that way and that makes the puzzle not so easy because you could just easily place your um, vegetables but when they're taking one and you need a certain amount of, of one kind or whatnot, or a higher point one, that can really mess you up. So that one's an interesting little solitaire puzzle. The last one is called Ecosystem, and this is by Matt Simpson. This is a multiplayer game. It plays, I think, with quite a few people too, like more than four, I believe. And this one you are 
placing cards down again. And it is, has all different types of animals, um, bears, wolves, there's, and then you have your, um, streams and meadows. You have your bees, your dragonflies, all different types of animals, bugs, and things that would be in an ecosystem. And you want to place these in a grid of a five by four grid. Eventually you have, I believe it's three rounds you play in a solo game. And what you do is you draft cards. You get a hand of cards and you will choose one for yourself and one to discard, which is basically the AI's card. And his will be just placed in a grid, like just one by one kind of thing. And yours, you can place however you want. But at the end, the final result will be a five by four. Well, certain things want to be by certain things. Like bears would love to be by bees um, because there's honey there, right? Uh, fish want to be next to a stream. And then dragonflies want to be next to a stream. No, a meadow, I believe. So they can get the, the mosquitoes or whatnot. There's also foxes. Now I'm forgetting what they want. I believe they want to be next to a meadow. But certain things want to be next to some things and not next to other things. So again, it's another little cool solitaire puzzle. And I really like that one. So yeah, those are my three honorable mentions. Now we will get into my top nine. My number nine game is called Tiny Towns, made in 2019 by Peter McPherson. This game is definitely just a puzzle. Like it's even in the multiplayer game of this, it's a complete puzzle. The mechanics of it are that it's a bingo mechanic where everyone on your turn, you get to choose a resource and everybody will take that resource and put it on their grid. And the grid is a four by three, I believe. And once you place that resource there, then the next player will choose one and you'll take what they want and so on and so on until you have made a configuration that you can build a building. Now, each game there's, I can't remember how many, like six or seven different buildings you can build. And you will also have one, um, is it called? It's it's a different type of building. Everybody has their own. It's an end game scoring one. And once you can build that, you can also put that out. But you just are trying to figure out what is the best way to score or get the most points, obviously. But how you do it is you could build like a whole bunch of one type of building, but then you might need to feed those buildings with other buildings that need to be near. Again, the same as the last two games I talked about except this one uses resources and buildings instead of cards. You And you don't have the choice of everything because everybody else around you is choosing. Whereas in a solo game, you're going to have three cards out with resources on them and you can choose one of those like each round. And as soon as you take one, put that card away and pull out another one. So you always have three options. They could all be the same if the cards came out that way. But if not, you have like a little bit more option. So you should be able to make your grid a little bit more successful than you would in a multiplayer game. So the scoring is a little bit higher than you would because you get more choices. But it's really neat because you each game will be different because you'll have a whole new set of buildings and you'll be like, okay, I want four of these and two of those. Now I have to make sure I can get them on my grid because... If I put a few buildings here and then block off an area where I can't even put resources, then I'm stuck and I can't build any more buildings. So it's really, really thinky because you you have to um, make sure you've left enough room on your board in order to build other ones. And not just room, it has to be the exact spaces because the shape that you have to build these buildings are like polyomino shapes. So you could have a T that you need. Well, now if you've already built something where you can't make a T anymore, you can never make that building. So it's really thinky this one, but I really like it. And it's funny, the first time I played it, I absolutely hated it. I played it at a convention in Edmonton and I can't even remember what the name it was. What the heck was that called? But it was a few years ago. I went to this one and 
someone had set this game up and there was about seven or eight of us. And I thought, wow, yes, the game plays at seven or eight. And it it's quick. Like it doesn't take any more time really than a four player game would, because once you fill your grid, you're full. But we played with this, I think he was an eight year old boy and it was a bunch of adults. And I, it took me a while to even figure out how to like, you know, configure your town well, he just kicked our butt. It was hilarious. I'm sure it's the first time he played too. I don't get to play a lot of like strategy games with kids, so it just always it just always astonishes me that these young kids can just pick up these strategy games so fast. It's awesome. I love it. I love seeing that. Um I had my kids were a bit older when I got into strategy games, so it wasn't I didn't get to see that they were almost adults. Well, I guess they were teenagers who didn't really want to play at the time. So, But once I got them into some higher strategy games, they were adults. And so it's, I mean, of course, it's nice to see them as well. But to see young kids pick up something that is so thinky and tricky, like simple rules, but so thinky and tricky is just really cool to me. And that was my number nine, Tiny Towns. My number eight is a game called Cristello. Now, this is a solo um, puzzle abstract card game, and it has a bit of a fantasy theme. But what you're doing is you're exploring the cavern lair of the wicked black dragon (laughs) by placing cards. And what what these cards have them all have on them are, are crystals. So they have all different colors of crystals and different numbers of them. So they could have a one crystal or a two crystal or a three crystal. But they, they'll be on, um, like there could be three or four configurations on one card. And what you're doing is you, you start with one card in the middle and then you'll take a card and you will place it on there. Now, when you cover something up, it, it doesn't matter what you cover up, but it's what you connect to it. So I don't know if any of you have ever played the game set, which is a, a game I had bought for my kids. It was a kind of a learning game when they were younger and it was, um, shapes and colors and the, they were, the shapes and colors were all shaded differently. So they were either solid striped or hollow. And so those were the three things, shapes, um, colors and shading. Now, what you wanted to do is you'd have all these cards in a, grid and you would the first person who could grab three that either had all the same thing or all the different all something different about them would get a set so it's it's kind of a hard to explain game and it it, I feel like it uses a different part of your brain because I would play this with some adults or you know some family members and they're like I just don't get it and then my son Chase would just snag up all these cards and we're like "Whoa, whoa, whoa we didn't even see anything yet but this game kind of uh, mimics that. Whereas you want, like on, you'd want connected either like um, a one crystal, two crystal, three crystal, or you'd want all three crystals or a one, um, or all different colors of crystals, or it's the same kind of thing. But once you connect them all, then you get to put a, um, a physical crystal because you have three of each color. And I think there's about six or eight different colors of crystals and you want to put it on there. Now, this is going to help you trap the dragon. So if you can complete all those, if you can like place all the crystals on the cards, that's how you win. Well, I'm not even sure if you win yet. You complete the game, then you go into this new round where you have another set of cards and you try to do a, a mini game, which is very similar. The other thing what you can do with these cards is there's different powers on them. And if you can connect those power cards to certain things, then you will get a power in the next round that will help you. It's really neat. And I have never beat this game. I haven't played it maybe 20 times. <laughs> Some of you out there might be laughing, but it's the tricky one for me. I've come to, I've passed the first round, but I've never passed the second round yet. So I kind of, I'll play it a few times and then I'm like, Oh, I can't stand this game. I put it away, think about it all night. Then two days later, pull back out. I got to beat it. I got to beat it. It's like one of those love hate games, but it's very cool and such a good design. And that's Cristello, my number eight. 
Now, my number seven, I think I've talked about before. This is called Shah Razad, made in 2015 by Yuo. This is a tile laying game. They're cardboard tiles, and they all have numbers on them and colors. Now, the story behind it is you are telling a story with these cards. That, to me, is a little bit um, pasted on, because I don't feel the theme in this one at all but it's still such a cool solitaire game so what you're doing is you are placing a tile one at a time and you can play this with two players as well i think it might even go up to oh no it's just two but i think it was made for solitaire and then they kind of added on a second player so what you're doing is you're placing these tiles on the table and you're gonna stagger them though you're gonna place them in a row in rows not really rows because they're staggered, but the columns are not staggered. So they are one on top of the other, and you can only go max three high. Now you're staggering the cards, um, placing, trying to have the lowest to the highest, and from top to bottom. So it sounds easy, and when I read the rules, I'm like, piece of cake. This is going to be the easiest thing I've ever done. I don't know why I even bought this game. And then you play it out, and it is tricky. <laughs> Because the other thing is, um, at the end of the game, you have to take all the cards or flip all the cards that are not going up in order. Because sometimes you'll have a card or a, a tile that you'll place, and at that point, it is higher than the card on the left. Or, but another time, you may place a card to the right. I keep saying card, but they're actually tiles to the right, and then a card on top of it that you haven't placed yet is not and like it's it's really hard one to explain if you want to check this one out z garcia has a review on it and he explains it very well but it's really neat the other thing is at the end of the game you have to make sure every single tile is connected from beginning to end so you may have like a column of one tile and then you have a column of three tiles well one of those tiles can only be connected to two, so one of them gets flipped. So if you flip that one, well, that may screw up the whole line that you have made ahead of that. I hope I'm explaining this right, but it is really quite interesting. And you guys have to check that one out. Just even watch a video. If you're into solo, like easy, literally no setup, you shuffle the tiles and you go. It's a, a cool little solitaire game. That's my number seven, Shah Razad. Now, my number six is a button shy game. I have a whole bunch of button shy games, and I could have listed a whole bunch on here, but I chose two that were probably my most played and most enjoyable for me. There's other ones like um, Sprawlopolis that I almost got rid of because it drove me nuts until I kind of figured it out, and then I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I can, I can actually win this game. But what The one I chose for number six is called Ugly Griffin Inn, and this was made in 2021 by Scott Alms. So what you're trying to do here, it's a card game, because all the button shy games, I believe all, maybe not, but most of them are 18 cards, and that's it. That's the game. The odd one or two requires like a few little cubes or something that you may have, but the ones I've listed here do not require anything just cards. So you have this little stack of cards that would be so easy to throw in your purse, wallet, pocket, whatever. Good travel too. And so what you do um, is you're, you place four patrons out on the board. And then on your turn, you're going to choose one of them to put in your inn. And you have floors in your inn now, but you can only put one like on the first floor and then second, third, so on. Now, how you do that is they all have on them, like they all have certain foods or beer on them, or they have different smells on them, or they may be noisy. So the first one you place, it doesn't matter. But the second one you place, you want to make sure it's not going to make the other one leave. Because the whole purpose of the game is you want, at the end of the game, when you go through the deck, you want to make sure you have seven patrons in your inn. If you have seven or more, you win the game. Sounds easy, but it's tricky because you have ogres in there that are really smelly, and then you have other, there might, I think there might even be a princess in there who does not want to be near smell, of course. So you have to make sure she's not near there. Then there's other ones where, um, like a, 
a werewolf and he will go in and he doesn't want to be on an odd number or he doesn't want to be on an even floor because if he is he's going to eat the person under him and take them with him obviously in his belly but it's kind of neat because it's a you know, I can't do this. This can't go ne- next to this one, but it can go here. And if I have another one might say, oh, if you have three beer in, then he's leaving and taking someone with them. So you kind of get, you know, two steps ahead, um, three back kind of game. It's a neat one, though. I really enjoy that one. That's my number six, Ugly Griffin Inn. Now, my number five is Cascadia, made in 2021 by Randy Flynn. Now, this one is, again, a super easy setup, and it's a multiplayer game, but it has a really neat solo variant and also a solo campaign, which I'm working on. It's a a puzzly game as well. You have these hexagon tiles, which are the different um, lands you could have, you know, water, desert, um, there's snowy and forest, all different things. And then, so you'll have four of those up for grabs. And then on top of them, you're going to have these, t- these small wooden tiles that are animals. So they could be fish, elk, bear, um, is it eagles? I think hawks. I think it's hawks. And it's the other animal. I'm blinking. So I always go for the bears. Oh, a fox. There's a fox there too. So what you want to do is all these tiles will have different options of animals you could put on them. Um, Some of them might only have one and some will have three. So what you do is you will draft um, a tile with a little cardboard chip and they are like lined up together. If you happen to draft one that is a solo, has just one animal on it, it comes with a little acorn, I believe they are, and it's just a cardboard chip, and then you take that as well. And what that would allow you to do is they are a point at the end of the game, but you can also use them to choose from the the table a different tile and a different chip instead of the ones that are in like a column. And what you're doing is you're placing the tiles and then also the animal at the same time. It doesn't have to go on the tile you placed could go you do start with like a three piece tile that has three on them already so you could put that uh, the little chip on the little cardboard chip on one of those and then place your other tile around it but what you're trying to do is you are trying to connect terrain but you're also trying to connect these animals in certain patterns now the game comes with i think it's five different scoring types for each animal And you can mix and match them throughout the game because you just have one per game per animal. And so you may want like the bears to be in in twos only and they don't want anyone else around them except for pairs. Or you may want the elk to be in like a line, like a whole line of elk, but nothing other like staggered through it, just the line. And you'll get like bigger points for the bigger line. You also will... Um, score for fish or salmon salmon like to be in runs so you want to do that or the hawks like to be either solo or like in a viewpoint of another hawk but not together like there's all different types of things it's a really neat game it's a really fun um, multiplayer game as well but such an easy solo game to pull out open the box you know pull out your 20 i think 23 tiles and the the little chips come in a bag so you don't even have to set those up those are just ready to go and you just play and put out your cards so such an easy setup i really love that one that's my number five cascadia now my number four is azul and it made in 2017 by michael keesling now this one i've talked about so often but and it is only a multiplayer game it doesn't actually have an official solo variant but this is a fan-made solo variant. It's quite neat, and it really, um, it really, like, uh, what's the word? It really implicates like what a an opponent would do, and it's such a simple way of doing it. How you play Azul is you have all these different tiles on these round factory cards. And on your turn, you get to choose all of one color from a factory and you get to take that and you put it on the side of your board, the left side of your board in a a row. 
and then the next player will do the same. Whereas in a solo game, you will always choose the most of one color, and then you will just put those aside. They just basically are taking tiles from you. They don't score or anything because you're just trying to reach a certain score. So you will, they will take those tiles and then on your turn, you will go again. And if it happens to be where it's a tie, there's two tiles on this factory, two on that one, they will always choose the left. So you're going to just line up your factories. Then once you come down to like only singles and you know, you only have one of something like one black, one teal, one red, you will pick them all up and shuffle them and drop one. And that's the one they would take. So it sounds like, you know, it's not very smart AI, but it <laughs> does a very good job of acting like an opponent. And I mean, I love this game. It's been on my deck games. I think it's been on my abstract games. It's just such a Zen-like game for me and an easy one to set up that I can just play over and over and over. And you're just trying to beat a score, I think, of 85, if you can get to 85 or over. It's not easy, but... It's pretty fun, and that's my number four, Azul. My next one is Nova Luna. Now, this one's made in 2019 by Uwe Rosenberg and Cornet Van, Van Morsel. Sorry, I had to have a drink there. And now, Uwe Rosenberg has so many different types of games. He's got his Polyomino series. He's got these big, heavy farming games. He's got all different types of things going on. But this one is quite different than his, like his polyomino and his big heavy farming games. This one is a tile game, but it uses these little discs and it's such a unique game. And I, this was one that I kind of passed over. It just didn't really look that interesting to me at first. And then I've kind of kept an eye on it over the years just to see, you know, what is it, is it getting big or people loving this game? And they were starting to really love this game. So I looked into it and I did mention that there was another person that helped him design this game. And the reason that is, is because this is implemented after a game that was made by this Corne Van Morsel called Habitats, which is a game that has been reprinted just recently. And of course I backed that. So that's coming to me in the fall. I'm so excited, but it's very similar. It has a similar mechanic to this. Only Habitats is going to have an animal theme and have a little bit more to it. But with Nova Luna, what you do on your turn is there's this rondelle of tiles and you would, um, in a multiplayer game, you would take a tile and then move your little pawn, however far that is. You can choose up to three ahead of it. And then on the tile, there's a number and say it was six, then you would move your pawn six spaces. And so it kind of uses the time mechanic that Patrick does. But this one in a solo game, you don't have to use your time because you can just choose up to three tiles in front of you and you go around this rondel until you've almost completely cleared all the tiles or have cleared all the tiles. So what you're doing is you're putting these tiles in a grid on your um, table, whatever, and on the, the little tiles will have different colors. And they'll have, say, like um, three blue two red and one yellow. I might even be getting the colors wrong here. But so what you do is you're going to put your little um, discs on those. And until you have tiles with those colors surrounding it, you cannot fulfill that tile. So this, if a one tile say needs three yellow, it wants to have three yellow tiles surrounding it or connected to it. So you could have one like three literally surrounding the tile, or you could have one tile next to it and two more that are connected to that tile. It sounds simple, but again, very tricky. And because you will have to take some tiles that you don't want and you have to find a spot to put them. And then it'll be interesting because you also sometimes will use up all your discs. And then, then what do you do? Well, then you have to take these negative discs and you have to go minus points and then you take these discs and it's just so funny because <laughs> you're really, really trying not to get these, these other tiles that, that are these red tiles that you use. But now, you know what? I might be confusing that with Sagani because that's his second game. He's got the, 
He's got the ones. I'm just going to look this up right away. This was, uh, these games are very similar. And I have both, and I play them both a lot. I know I like Nova Luna better for solo. But I'm just looking up the the negatives here. I know there's negatives. No, I'm not finding it. But I may have confused it a little bit with Sagani, but they are both very good games. Nova Luna has a better solo variant. So that was my number three, Nova Luna. Now, number two is another Button Shy game, and this is Food Chain Island, made in 2020 by Scott Alms. Again, Scott Alms does a few of these cool little Button Shy games. This one is, it's kind of unique because you have 18 cards and most of them are the animals that you are using on your grid. So you place out, I believe it's a four by four grid. There are little expansions that can make it bigger, but I think it's a four by four it starts with. And they all have numbers on them and they're all different types of animals. And what you need to do is you need to condense it to one. So how you do that is the higher number can eat the number um, up to three lower than it. And once it, but it has to be next to it in order to do it because you will move one card, say like just um, orthogonal, orthogonal, not diagonal, um, to another card and then basically eat that animal. And then on the card, there's an ability. Now the ability might say, okay, now this animal can't eat the next turn, or now you have to eat an animal by moving diagonal, or you have, you can eat an animal, um, four lower, or just like, they all have something different. It's very puzzly. And then you do have three other animals that will give you like a special ability, say like you can move one animal three spaces or you can move one anywhere because sometimes you'll have like, you know, a 10 at the top corner and then nine at the bottom. And you're like, how am I going to get those together in order for one to eat the other? It's, it could be, uh, well, it mostly is a five minute game, but you could sit and really have some AP over this game. Cause if you, you know, looked at all the cards and kind of made a whole plan it could take a while. I don't play that way. I just kind of, okay, I'm going to eat this guy. He's going to go over here and this one's going to do this. You know, I don't overthink this one. This one's just a, an easy, like, you know, solitaire game in front of the TV that I play, <laughs> but it's a, it's a fun one. And it could be very strategic if you literally planned out your whole plan of how that you were going to eat all these animals. And that's my number two, Food Chain Island. Now down to my number one, this one, I think, is my most played game. It definitely of last summer. Maybe not since then, but I must have played it a hundred times last summer. It was such an easy little pretty game that I'd pull out um, my deck and play over and over and over. This one was made in 2021 by Kevin Wilson. Not sure if I said that, but anyway, this is a tile laying game. So you have these little square tiles. Well, they're not really square, but they're not hexagonal either. No, maybe they are. They're kind of a different shape. But anyway, so you'll place one down and on it, it has different flowers around it. Now, as soon as you put another tile um, next to it, you m will try to enclose like a circle. So the tiles, once there's like four together, there's a little circle in the middle. So it's kind of neat how they did it. So yeah, they're not hexagons because they have like round outs in them. I'm not even sure what shape that would be called. But anyway, so you place these tiles down. And once you have connected a pattern with like light colors that um, and are it's really hard to explain this one over audio, It'd be easier to show you, but you want to make sure that you have this pattern. And then once you do, whatever flowers you've connected, you can choose one of them to put in the middle. Now you have one of each color of flower, this little wooden tile that you can stick right in the middle and it fits right in there. Like the tiles are, are cardboard, but the little flowered circles are um, wood. So you'll place that in the middle and then you'll keep going on and you just take one tile at a time and you place it. And sometimes you kind of screw yourself because you place one so that you have two of the same colored flower and that will be connecting 
another pattern, which totally screws it up because each um, tile has different ones on it. So you're never going to have one that has two orange on it, say. So there's a lot of times where you think you just got it all perfect. Then you look at your at your um, tableau there and you've got three different ones that you've already messed up and can never connect anything on them. It is frustrating, but it's a fun game as well. And it's kind of neat because when you open the rule book, it says something like, okay, now take a deep breath and grab a cup of tea or something like that. <laughs> they are really wanting it to be a Zen game, which is kind of funny. But what you're t- trying to do is place all your um, little uh, wooden tiles and that's how you win the game. Now, if you've done it by the time before the tile deck is out, you win. But if you have some left over, then that gives you a higher score. So I think the highest I've got is having eight leftover tiles. If anyone else has beat me, I, they need to they need to let me know because I want to know what is uh, is good, like what's a really good score, and I will try and get there. It's an awesome, pretty little tiny game, which is also good for travel. And that's my number one, A Gentle Rain. So that's all of my list for easy setup solo games. I'm sure in the future I will do another solo list with my big heavy games that I like. And I'm looking forward to playing a few more of those because my daughter is moving out of my house for the first time. Her and her have partner have bought a house and they are so excited moving in tomorrow and so that means my son will move downstairs and I'll have a whole new room upstairs now what I'm going to do with that room is I'm going to put a big long table like desk and then I can have a campaign solo game sitting out all the time that I don't have to put away I don't have to rush to finish it because the coffee table or the kitchen table needs to be used that is going to be my room where I'm going to, you know, dig into a lot of these campaign heavier games. And I'm quite excited for that. So stay tuned for that at some point. But until next time, thanks for listening. Bye for now.